Hello? Michael Eisner? I got your letter to meet you at this oddly remote location to patch things up. Anyone there? You're not Michael Eisner. Well, gee, Mark, that's a smart observation, but it's about time we had a little chat, haha. <laughs> Mickey, you're scaring me. Two years. What? Over two years, and you still haven't covered my one and only attraction. None of the Disney parks would have been possible without me, haha. <laughs> well, I've been meaning to, but... No more buts. You're going to tell the story about my attraction and the one-of-a-kind show, because there's a lot more to the story than people think, haha. <laughs> and if I don't... Our lost our world. Our story begins in 1962 with an interview in Newsweek with Walt Disney. Alongside discussing the company, future movies, and new television programs, Disney spoke about the development of what he then described as life-size electronic dolls. Now for a little backstory, originally this technology was planned for the attractions within the ultimately unrealized Edison Square and Liberty Street. Edison Square was to feature an attraction called Harnessing the Lightning and feature what was then referred to as Electronic Personalities. The other two attractions to use this technology were to be the Declaration of Independence and Hall of Presidents in Liberty Street. Though neither land would become a reality, Harnessing the Lightning later evolved into the Carousel of Progress. The Hall of Presidents would serve as inspiration for great moments with Mr. Lincoln's groundbreaking animated figure which, oddly enough, began as a Confucius head to greet visitors for an unbuilt Disneyland Chinese restaurant. The technology within these attractions would also play a major role in the creation of the Enchanted Tiki Room. Now, at the time of the article, these were all still in development, but there were two other attractions Walt Disney was planning to implement these animated figures, later coined as audio animatronics. One was a haunted house, which of course later became the Haunted Mansion. The other was an experience involving all the Disney characters in a theater. These animated figures would not only put on the show, but would sit in boxes with the visitors, presumably heckling the performers. This all-Disney character show was initially envisioned for Disneyland, but the ideas presented in the interview never went much farther beyond Walt's description. And now, ladies and gentlemen, a progress report on the new Walt Disney World in Florida. Fast forward to the late 1960s when development of the Magic Kingdom was going full speed ahead, and Imagineers were brainstorming ideas for new attractions. By this point, of course, Walt Disney had tragically passed away, so keeping his memory alive and all that he had accomplished was a big priority to those involved in the Florida project. Enter artist and Imagineer Bill Justice, who had served as one of the animatronic programmers for the original Pirates of the Caribbean. In his own words, he believed attractions were getting away from Disney's heritage, as while Pirates of the Caribbean was a big hit, it had very little to do with Disney and his past creations. So using Walt's original idea presented in that 1962 interview, he began designing a show revolving around Disney characters. He eventually presented the idea to Roy Disney, who instantly gave his approval to begin development. Then titled The Mickey Mouse Musical Review, the attraction would feature virtually every memorable Disney character in the form of animated figures. A few such as The Big Bad Wolf, Pinocchio, Geppetto, and Horace Horsecollar would appear in promotional material but would ultimately be scrapped in revisions. The star of the attraction was, of course, Mickey Mouse, and at the time would be Disney's most advanced animatronic ever developed. The basic premise involved Mickey as a conductor of a large assembly of classic Disney characters in his orchestra. However, Imagineers would leave out one of the specifics Walt originally had in mind, the characters in the theater box heckling the performers. Now, I don't know if it's just a coincidence, but a little over five years later, a certain Jim Henson would feature two characters in The Muppet Show, sitting in a theater box, heckling performers in the audience. So they blew up half the theater. At least they blew up the right half. There. <laughs> the Mickey Mouse musical review would be no easy task, as it would feature not 5, 10, or even 20 animated figures, but a total of 81. Initially, the show was promoted to have 86, but this more than likely included the scrapped animated figures mentioned earlier. 
The attraction would also be the first ever computer program stage show and consist of nearly 80 individually recorded soundtracks. Construction of the theater began around two years before the park was to open, and it wasn't long before the animatronics began their installation. However, while Mickey Mouse was the star, he'd share the spotlight with the three caballeros during the Magic Kingdom's first preview event. Inside the reception center, a special theater had been constructed in which to present the Disney World story. The main feature was a scale model visualization of what Disney World would look like on opening day. By the time the park finally opened in October of 1971, the Mickey Mouse musical review had been shortened to simply the Mickey Mouse Review, and had also been one of the most heavily promoted attractions within the entire park. In fact, one storybook acted as a sort of backstory to the show. One day, Mickey Mouse wakes up from a nap to his nephews excitedly delivering him a telegram. As it turns out, Walt Disney World is going to have a Mickey Mouse review, and in a shocking twist, he's invited to conduct the orchestra. He tries to share the exciting news with Minnie, but she doesn't have time to chat since she's off to go buy a new hat. Horace, which I just realized is an abbreviation of horse race, also doesn't seem to give a mouse's caboose about his exciting news. The same goes for the three little pigs, as well as Geppetto who's too busy working, Pinocchio who doesn't seem to know what the word orchestra means, as well as Donald, Huey, Dewey, and Louie. No one seems to care. What about Dumbo? Surely because of his traumatic childhood he'd show some enthusiasm for Mickey's news, but he cares more about his flying skills. Even Daisy thinks Dumbo's flying is more important than Mickey's exciting news. Mickey broods all the way to Florida, but cheers up once arriving to the Magic Kingdom, where a giant sign points towards his review. But as it turns out, they were all just messing with him, as it would actually be performers in his orchestra, which in my opinion still doesn't change my mind about the book deserving a new title of Mickey Needs New Friends. Even if they're, I don't know, imaginary. Golly, Disneyland looks swell this morning! <laughs> hiya! Ah, hi Jennifer! Upon entering the attraction, you'd find yourself in a mostly pink pre-show lobby. The walls were decorated with paintings of Mickey Mouse from his various appearances in both Disney films and animated shorts. But the real experience began in the first auditorium with an eight-minute pre-show exploring Disney's connection to music. Hi. I'm just so happy that silly old dream just heard. Oh, I'm happy that you just heard. Unfortunately, a mistake was made during construction, and the auditorium held about 200 less visitors than the main theater, so technically the pre-show never played to a full audience. <laughs> After Mickey invited visitors into the main theater, which was recorded prior to the attraction's name change, they'd find themselves in a beautiful and much larger auditorium, with a massive curtain hiding the stage. The show began with the curtain separating to reveal Mickey Mouse, followed by the assembly of Disney characters. Ha <laughs> One, two, three, four! The lights darkened, and the orchestra began with a rendition of Hi-Ho and Whistle While You Work from Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, giving the audience a taste of the impressive animatronics. This led to When You Wish Upon a Star, as performed by many on the violin, and Ka playing his own body as a flute. Suddenly, the rest of the orchestra came alive with a quick rendition of Hi Diddly Dee from Pinocchio. This led to a menacing undertone as the shadow of the Big Bad Wolf, who was originally supposed to appear as an animatronic, appeared on the curtains. And this was followed by the three little pigs performing their iconic theme. I'm wishing. Snow White then sang I'm Wishing as she was surrounded by the fully animated creatures and animals of the forest. This transitioned into the Seven Dwarves performing the iconic and memorable Silly Song, with Snow White joining the melody a short time later. Then the curtains closed and the focus was given to Alice and the Singing Flowers, who performed a bit of All in the Golden Afternoon. Then came the first appearance of the three caballeros, who sang their iconic theme, and this was actually one of the more lively portions of the show, as they would disappear and reappear in different parts of the theater. Then came the fairy godmother from Cinderella, who sang Bippity Bobbity Boo, and after a rather impressive scene transition from the old rags to her ball gown, the shadows of her and the prince waltz to sow this his love. 
The finale was a bit of a glimpse into a future attraction, as Br'er Rabbit, Br'er Fox, and Br'er Bear sang zippity doo dah from the classic and beloved Disney film Song of the South. And by classic Disney film, I mean the only Disney film that's never been released on any video format within the US, and a very limited time in Europe on VHS in 1997. The future cast of Splash Mountain were then joined by the entire orchestra, including animatronics of Cinderella and the Prince. The show ended with a brief rendition of the Mickey Mouse Club song as Mickey bid the audience farewell. When the Magic Kingdom opened, the Mickey Mouse Review wasn't the only musical consisting of animatronic performers, because over in Frontierland was the Country Bear Jamboree. Though both were initially very popular, Country Bear Jamboree was the only one of the two that actually seemed to grow in popularity, with the queue often stretching out into the streets. The Mickey Mouse Review never quite reached that level of attendance, and just two years after opening, it was downgraded from an E-ticket attraction to a D-ticket attraction, which was a pretty uncommon move for Disney during the ticket system years. But contrary to popular belief, that's not the reason for its short lifespan at the Florida Disney Park. In 1979, a deal was signed between Disney and the Oriental Land Company for the official development of Tokyo Disneyland. In the years leading up to this, the Japanese company had visited both Disneyland and the Magic Kingdom to gather ideas for what sort of attractions they'd want in their future Disney park. Despite language barriers, music from the iconic Disney films had a universal and worldwide appeal, so they chose the Mickey Mouse Review as one of the park's opening day attractions. This, combined with its decline in popularity, gave Disney an idea why not just save money and literally ship the attraction to Tokyo instead of building a new version from the ground up? This was far from a new idea as the Carousel of Progress had moved from Disneyland to the Magic Kingdom just a few years earlier. So on September 14, 1980, the Mickey Mouse Review gave its final performance and work began on moving it over to Tokyo. <laughs> There's honestly not much to talk about for its Tokyo version, since virtually every aspect of the attraction was identical to its Florida predecessor. The only big difference was the show being dubbed with Japanese vocals in the soundtrack. Back over at the Magic Kingdom, once the Mickey Mouse Review closed in 1980, the Fantasyland Theater remained mostly abandoned, apart from occasional showings of Disney cartoons. However, in 1986, with Captain Neo's replacement of Magic Journeys over at Epcot, the film was brought to the Fantasyland Theater where it ran until 1993, when something much, much bigger came along. This summer, Walt Disney Pictures presents an entertainment event you will never forget. I don't need to tell you just how big of a deal The Lion King was. It smashed box office records, its music was universally praised, and would instantly become one of Disney's most iconic and beloved animated films. On a personal note for those who have asked me in the past, it's also my favorite Disney animation, and the death of Mufasa still makes me cry to this very day. Moving on. During the film's production, Disney had a feeling the animation would be a success, so they began developing a Lion King-based attraction for the Magic Kingdom. So just weeks after the Lion King opened in theaters, The Legend of the Lion King made its debut in Fantasyland. Why would Disney put this in the show? Legend of the Lion King used what Disney called humanimals, essentially incredibly large puppets that faithfully captured the look and feel of their on-screen counterparts. The show itself was a mix of retelling of the film's narrative through eight memorable scenes, which was narrated by the only live actor Rafiki, along with showing clips from the movie. The technology and puppetry was groundbreaking to say the least, and from the very beginning was incredibly popular. So what killed this highly praised show? Two words, Animal Kingdom. Let the Festival of the Lion King stage show move you, as live singers and wild acrobats celebrate the circle of life. In 1998, Animal Kingdom debuted its own Lion King show named Festival of the Lion King, which proved to be just as, if not more popular than Legend of the Lion King. This heavily affected Magic Kingdom show, and it began to see a steady decline in attendance. So in 2002, Legend of the Lion King was permanently closed. 
However, it would live on in Disneyland Paris, uh, sort of. Disneyland Paris would open a new show of the same name, but this version was a hybrid between Animal Kingdom's Festival of the Lion King and the massively popular Broadway musical. The puppets themselves would live on in a separate show called Animagic, which featured the characters of young Simba, young Nala, and Zazu. The other characters weren't as lucky, as while they spent some time on display, eventually they were abandoned at one of MGM Studios' old walking tour stages. Personally, I find this particular image of Teenage Simba incredibly disturbing, considering, you know. Dad? Dad, come on. Who's cutting onions? Darn this scene. Back over at the Magic Kingdom, once Legend of the Lion King closed, it was decided the time was right for a new attraction that would pay homage to the Mickey Mouse Review. Mickey's Philhar Magic. Much like its predecessor, Mickey once again was the conductor of an orchestra. That is until Donald gets involved and takes visitors through classic Disney films of the Renaissance era. Magic meets sight and sound with a fill of characters of Disney past and present. The attraction opened in 2003, and the reaction was positive, as it both paid tribute to its past while providing a brand new experience for a new generation. Now, there's a reason I haven't mentioned Tokyo Disney's Mickey Mouse review in a while, because surprisingly, it was still alive and well by this point, and it lasted even longer than its time at the Magic Kingdom. However, seeing the popularity of Philhar Magic, it was decided to replace the Mickey Mouse review with the same show, and was permanently closed in 2009, and this time for good. But like any great story here on Yesterworld, over the years, various animatronics from the show made their way into other attractions. Kind of. It's long been rumored that for a brief time, one of the backup Snow White animatronics made its way into Snow White's scary adventure. When Disneyland's Alice in Wonderland Dark Ride was given a major overhaul for New Fantasyland, Alice and the Singing Flowers were made from the same molds used in the Mickey Mouse review. In the 1990s, either the original molds or some claim backup versions of the Seven Dwarves were used in Snow White's major overhaul at the Magic Kingdom, and can still be seen in the Seven Dwarves Mine Train. But most famously, with the closure of the Mickey Mouse review at Tokyo Disney, the three caballeros were shipped over to Epcot to use in the Grand Fiesta Tour in the Mexico Pavilion. However, due to the costs of updating the animatronics, instead they were put on display at various exhibits and went in and out of storage for half a decade. Thankfully, in 2015, they finally made their way into the attraction, and is one of my favorite examples of truly repurposed animatronics with roots in Disney history. As far as Mickey Mouse himself, he often travels around the world as featured in various exhibits and displays. What makes this figure even more significant is that it's the only time Mickey Mouse has been represented as an animatronic in Disney Park's entire history, at least for now. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and if you haven't already, make sure to check out the Yesterworld podcast, and the link is in the description below. And we'll see you next time in Yesterworld.